We're starting now with this uh, afternoon session, and it's my pleasure to welcome here Salvador Ventura from the Institut de Biologia, Biotecnologia i Biomedicina de la Universitat Autònoma. Uh, we are good friends from yeah. the time many years ago when I was in the lab of Aviles, and he was also. He's an expert on, on protein aggregation and uh, neuro uh, diseases, uh -huh. and he's going to talk uh, about novel therapies from for the transtyretin amyloidosis. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Xavi. Thanks a lot, Bernard, for this kind invitation. So what I'm going to talk to you today is a project we began like two years ago dealing with this kind of amyloidosis. So I'm going to talk to you today about a protein. I don't know whether you know it or not. It's transthyretin. So transthyretin is a normal blood protein you everybody have in the blood. And it's made mostly by the liver. And it's secreted into the bloodstream. But also you have transthyretin, and I'm going to call it TTR from now on. You also have TTR in the brain and within the eyes, OK? And this is kind of two different compartments. The one you have in the blood doesn't go to the brain. The one you have in the brain doesn't go into the blood. You have the blood-brain barrier, and this uh, stops it. The function of TTR is transport the thyroid hormone and vitamin A within the blood, and hence the name, transport of thyroxine and retinol. And what is relevant for us is that it's one of these called uh, amyloid diseases. So essentially, you know, the proteins are usually made to be soluble. In some cases, the protein aggregates. In some cases, they aggregate into amyloid fibrils, which are very stable assemblies. And the formation of these amyloid fibrils is linked to a number of human diseases, like, you know, of course, Parkinson, Huntington, Alzheimer's disease, but many others. Indeed, 37 different diseases are linked to the fact that a protein that is soluble suddenly it aggregates, right? It becomes toxic. It's an orphan disease, and in this case, it's caused by the extracellular deposition of amyloid fibrils can, that can be both from the normal protein or from mutants, right? What it causes is problems in the nervous system or in the heart or in both them, right? Of an adult onset. The problem is that when it's diagnosed, the life expectancy is 5 to 15 years and there is no cure for it so far. And moreover, if to put it more in trouble, it's autosomal and dominant. So you only have to have one of the two alleles compromised and you will have the disease, okay? It's an orphan disease, but it's the most common form of hereditary amyloidosis, right? With a strong focus on Sweden, Portugal, and Japan. So this is the protein. The protein is a normal tetramer. So you can see here two axes of symmetry, one axis here, one axis there. Right? It's a 56 kilo Dalton, so it's not very big, and mainly beta sheets. There are more than 100 mutations that lead to the disease with different severities. Right? If you ask me where the mutations occur in the gene, they occur everywhere. If you ask me where they occur in the protein, everywhere. So this is a monomer. Any red dot means an amylogenic fatal mutation, right? So it can be in the beta, it can be in the alpha, it can be in the loop everywhere, right? And the mechanism is this one, for all the mutants and for the wild type protein. As long as you have the tetramer, you are safe. The tetramer is not toxic, it's functional, and you are safe. But if for any reason the protein dissociates, the monomer is very unstable. It misfalls and it aggregates. First, it forms oligomers, then protofibrils, and then amyloid fibrils, which, as you may know, they are very rich in beta sheet structure. They are extremely stable, they are very toxic, and the proteasome, for instance, cannot degradate it. Okay? So this is the main problem. Depending on the mutation, and depending on the, the site of the position, in fact, we can talk of four different TTR amyloidosis. We have familial amyloid polyneuropathy, where the deposition is in the periphery nervous, some mutations give it to this phenotype. The prevalence is one in each 100,000 people. Familial amyloid cardiomyopathy, there the position is outside of the heart. And this is very important in America because up to 4% of the Afro-American population suffer from this disease. You don't even have to have the mutation. The wild protein, when you get old, can aggregate and make deposits in the heart and you will have a heart attack, very likely. And then you have also the position inside the brain, which is called CNS selective amyloidosis. This is extremely rare. It's very, very few cases in the world, but it's extremely aggressive, okay? 
So this is a different types, and the only thing is depend on the mutant you have. The problem again is that once you have the diagnosis for this disease, you already have the amyloid deposit, right? So it's very difficult to treat. <clears throat> so, so far, what people that have these mutations can do. This is a guy, a few weeks before the diagnosis, five years later, right? So it's very, very hard disease. This is a guy that has the cardiac variant, and what you are seeing here is a staining for TTR. Okay, you can see how the heart is plenty of TTR. So this is extremely debilitating. Right, so the only way to treat this disease is either liver or combined liver and heart transplantation. The rationale is very simple. You eliminate the main production site, so you eliminate the liver, right? Even though it works, 80 to 90% of the cases you can treat with this uh, approach. It's very aggressive, you need lifelong immunosuppression, and moreover, there is a problem which is what we call the seeding effect. So even if you replace the liver for a wild-type liver, right, you already have aggregates in your body. And these aggregates act as seeds, like when you make crystals, right? And they kidnap the wild-type protein into the aggregate, right? So the other options are only symptomatic relief of pain and uh, motion. So clearly there's a need for new diseases and very likely molecular oriented uh, therapeutics. Let's see a little bit why these proteins or these mutations increase aggregation and uh, activity. So the native tetramer is safe and it doesn't go into the monomer much often. And this is because you have a high energy barrier of dissociation. So you have to pass this barrier to go in the monomer. Once you're in the monomeric part, this is downhill and rapidly you form amyloid fibrils. But the wild protein doesn't pass this barrier very often. What the mutants do is they decrease this barrier. So you can pass from here to here or shift from here to here more often. The lower the barrier, the most aggressive the mutant and the early the disease develops, right? So the way to try to cure or to prevent this disease is targeting this barrier. And this was found already in the 90s. In the 90s, there was researchers in the States that found that when the protein is bound to one of its natural ligands, thyroxine, so T4, which binds in this symmetric, so in this side, there are two binding sites for T4, right? The protein is more stable. You have a ligand there, and the protein is more stable. Higher stability means lower dissociation. Lower dissociation means lower aggregation, right? So putting something here, it's a good strategy. The problem is that less than 1% of the TTR in blood circulates bound to T4, okay? And you cannot use T4 as a treatment because then you will have a strong problems in the thyroids, right? Then it comes a discovery made by serendipity, again, <coughs> in this case by an American and a Japanese group. So they were working with this compound, which is Diflunisal, is an anti-inflammatory drug nothing to do with this kind of amyloidosis. But what they found is a part of the drug was somehow remaining in the blood. And you can guess where it was remaining. It was bound to TTR. So it was bound to the protein and it stabilized it. So the flunisal works. It stabilizes the protein, which is the problem here, that it was not intended for this application, right? So the binding affinity is extremely low. Even though, even the binding affinity is very low, this drug I'm sorry, is already in phase three clinical trials, okay? Then it comes the work of Jeff Kelly. Jeff Kelly has been dominating this field for a long time. And what they say is, can we make a drug that binds specifically uh, with high affinity to these two pockets, and then we can stop the disease? And they, after 11 years of research from the first paper, they attain it, and they develop a molecule which is called tafamidis. Right? This tafamidis is able to inhibit the aggregation of the wild type, of the neuropathic variant, of the cardiac variant, uh, in a dose-dependent manner. So this is aggregation, this is inhibition, right? And it does this thing, stabilizing the protein, which is what you expect. You stabilize the protein, and the protein doesn't aggregate. Good. They made the crystal structure, the compound docks where it was intended, and it stabilizes this interface. If you stabilize this interface, which is the weaker interface, the protein doesn't dissociate, 
and you are safe. You have it in the market, it's been the kill, you can buy it, right? And it was, and it is, the first drug for a conformational disorder, okay, which is in the market. And it was a proof of principle indeed. They sell the company, the start company, for a lot of money, right? The problem with Bindakel is first that it's only a proof in, Euro in Europe and also in Japan now, but it's not a proof in the States. This is the first thing, because lack of principal activity. And the second, th second thing is that if you want to treat somebody with tough amides, the cause is this one, okay? By passion, by year. So it's more than 140,000 euros. And in Portugal, Brazil, these regions, it's very difficult to afford. So what we ask is, can we get a drug that is as good as the families, but much cheaper. And if you go to the NH page, National Institute of Health in the States, you will discover that the average time between the discovery of a new compote and bringing it to the market is around 13 years. This is the average, okay? In 95% of the cases, you will fail, okay? And the average cost for a drug is more than $1,000 million, okay? Of course, our lab cannot go into this kind of assays. But you can do another thing. And all the things I'm going to explain to you today, well, half of the things I'm going to explain to you, we have been do done hand by hand with a Catalan company, which is some biotech, okay? So what you can do is make drug repurposing. What is drug repurposing? It's using a drug that you already is in the market or is in the phase three clinical trials that serves for something, you use it for another thing, right? You give it a new application, and there are very nice examples. Sildenafil from Pfizer, right? It was intended for hypertension. Now it goes zero, but you know what is being converted into, it's Viagra, right? So it was a secondary effect, and this secondary effect is Pfizer, which is the same house that developed the initial drug, has taken profit of that. And you know why Viagra is blue and rhomboid? simply because the first drug was round and white, okay? So you just change the package and you give the same doses. And this is safe and you cannot go, you don't have to go to any safety assays. The second famous one is Finasteride from Merck, was intended for prostatic hypertrophy and now is used for heart loss, right? So you can see the price increases, exactly the same formulation, okay? Unfortunately, I discovered it too late, right? <laughs> So what we have done with some? We have done, we have begun to make drug virtual screen. The idea is very simple, I'm not going to go into detail, but what you have is, you have a molecule, you generate from this molecule what is called a molecular field, which is nothing else than a description of the properties in the space, and you try to align a series of molecules that you know that are in the market, or they are in clinical phase three, to this one, and if they match, it can be that the molecule you found, even if it's not identical in structure, could serve for this application. Okay, so it's the last bit of screen. And this is what we did. What we did is we take the CIMIX composite medicinal chemistry database in which you have 9,000, around 9,000 compounds. You, that, you don't have to work with compounds, you work with the structures. So what you have to mimic is like 44,000 different three-dimensional structures. And we use Tafamidis of course, as the reference compound. And we virtually docket each compound on top of the other, and we found 200 top hit compounds. And then what we did is we take each single of these compounds and we dock it in the trans cavity. And we calculated energies, and on the basis of that, we selected 30 compounds, in fact, 29 compounds proof tafamidis for experimental characterization. How good is virtual screening? Very bad. Virtual screening, I mean, it's not outstanding. So we use this mutant. This mutant is a mutant which is non-natural. We created it in the lab, and it's very aggressive, right? This allows us to make very fast screenings. Okay. And what you analyze is the ability of the compounds to inhibit the aggregation, and the AC50 of the families is 5 micromolar, right? If you look at 20 of the compounds, they were worthless. Even if they dock it perfectly in the cavity of TTR, when you make them experimentally, they are not able to stop anything. Eight of them are good enough to make a normal publication, right? But not much than that. And then we were lucky enough that one of the compounds was in the same order of magnitude 
than TAF and BBs. And this compound, since I can show you because it's patented, is Tolcapone. Tolcapone is sell now as Tasmar, and Tasmar is used, is FDA approved, very important, it's also used in Europe, and is used for, uh, a, as a coadjuvant for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Okay, and this is important because this means that the compound arrives to the brain, okay? So what we did next is to characterize whether we can compete the families, which remember is the only drug in the market now, with our compound. The first thing we did is, this is a stability assay, it's very simple, you put the protein, TTR, this is wild type, in the presence of urea, and then the protein unfolds and dissociates, right? So this is a cure, here is 0% uh, unfolded, 100% unfolded. You can see that when you put 10 molar excess of the compound, the protein doesn't unfold anymore. Okay, and this is of course dose dependent, right? So you increase the dose, you put the protein in six molar urea, and you protect it from unfolding. In fact, with one molar equivalent, so one molecule in each binding site in theory, you are able to stop 80% of the abbreviation, of the unfolding. If you stop unfolding, you expect to uh, stop abbreviation as well, okay? And this is what this slide says. So this is Tafamidis, we could reproduce the data. It stops propagation in a concentration-dependent manner, but you can see that Tolcapone does it much better. You need less concentration to attain total inhibition. And with the wild type, we can stop totally the abrogation of the, this molecule. This is the uh, cardiac variant. It's much more aggressive, but still we do it much better than Tafamidis, okay? So the compound stops aggregation, but we don't know yet whether it binds to the place where it should bind. So what we make is two experiments. The first experiment is very simple. You take TTR, and then you label, you radio label T4, okay? T4 goes into the cavity, and you have the radioactivity in the cavity. And then you put your compounds, and you see whether they can compete or not this T4, and you can see that Tolcapone competes T4 at four times less concentration than Tafamidis. And four times is going to be a constant in my talk, okay? Then we make ITC, isothermal titration calorimetry, and we analyze the binding, and it comes the first surprise. The first surprise is that when you analyze the binding of the compound to the wild type protein, even if you, we know that it's better to stop abrogation, Tafamidis binds with higher affinity to the first binding site, right? But what happens is that with this inhibitor and all the inhibitors that have been reported so far in vitro for TTR, there's a strong negative cooperativity, right? So you see the binding for the second site is much, much uh, weaker. You need more concentration. In Tolcapone, this is also true, but this negative cooperativity is lower. And this means that I can fill the cavities, the two cavities, with far less mass, much concentration. And if you look at the cardiac barrier, and this is spectacular. So you pass from nanomolar, 29, to millimolar, in the case of Tafamidis, and in Tolcapone, and this was very hard to demonstrate and to convince the reviewers that it was like that, there is no negative cooperativity, so it binds with the same affinity to the binding sites. And of course, much higher than, uh, much tighter than the Tafamidis. What is nice of this compound, this is a lucky compound, is when you go to the energetics, okay, you have for binding two contributions always, entropy and enthalpy. And what you want to have for a good compound is enthalpy, because enthalpy means context. So usually when you make a screening, you get compounds that half contribute entropy and enthalpy, and then you try to improve the contribution of enthalpy by generating new groups, okay? This one, take a look at that. It's absolutely enthalpy driven. So nothing to optimize. I mean, and this will mind that we have a specific context. We solved the crystal extraction. In fact, I say we, but it was David Reverte in our institute, and with very good uh, resolution, and Tolcapone is in the right place. So one here, one here, and what is nice is that what differentiates Tolcapone from Tafamidis is that it makes a specific contest with the protein. So it makes a contact with this lysine, which is transmitted to this glutamic acid, and I don't know if you can appreciate that, but this closes the cavity, where here is more open. So we made a tighter interface, right? And the same, even more spectacular, for the cardiac variant, right? Again, the same type of contacts and a much closer cavity than in the case of Tafamidis, which is not very good for that, okay? So the protein binds to the right place and it's stuck in the right context and it makes the right contacts. But of course, this is in vitro, 
right? It should work in plasma, it should work in blood. And this is what we are saying is, okay? Imagine the compounds bind to TTR, but in blood you have around 3,000 different proteins. So if it binds to any other protein, it will not arrive to TTR. So what you see here is the plasma of a wild type donor and a guy that has the disease, right? And what you're seeing here is a native gel. This is a labeling with T4, right? So you see here TTR, level of what with T4. One important thing is that TTR is not the main transporter of T4 in blood, and therefore you can block it without any, any consequence. When you put in the plasma tolcapone or tafamidis, there is no more binding because your compound arrives to the right side and displaces it, okay? And if it displaces it and it bounds, what it does, it does, it stabilizes the protein in plasma, right? And you can see that tolcapone stabilizes the protein much more than it does the families, right? And this is dose dependent, okay? If you put increasing concentrations in plasma, you increasingly uh, stabilize TTR in plasma. Good. At the end of the day, you don't want to stop aggregation. What you want to stop is toxicity, right? The toxicity associated to aggregation. So the next thing we did is we make two assays in two different systems. These are cardiac cells. So these cells are cardiomyocytes. If you look at them, they are amazing. They move, okay, like it were heart, and it's the best system to emulate the cardiac uh, variant of the disease. When you put TTR, either the wild type or the cardiac variant, cell viability drops out. When you put the compounds into the cell culture, you recover cell viability. So the compound is able to recover the cytotoxicity or to eliminate the cytotoxicity associated to aggregation. And this system is another system. This is the neuropathic variant. Therefore, the cells are neuroblastomas or neuropathic variant with neuronal cells. And again, in this case, what you measure is uh, caspase activity. And when you treat it with tolcapone, especially, you decrease the apoptosis of the cells. So again, you protect against uh, toxicity. This is a system I like it a lot. These are cells that secrete the protein. So they are kind of a mini liver, right? And when the protein is secreted to the medium, what we do is we take a filter trap. Filter trap is very simple. It's a membrane that allows to pass soluble protein, but doesn't allow to pass the aggregates. And then you use an antibody to detect TTR. And you can see that when you use this variant, which is a very aggressive variant, what happens is the protein in the medium is absolutely aggregated, right? But if you put in the cells before tolcapone or tafamidis, there is no aggregation anymore. So the, the compound is able to enter in the cells and prevent aggregation. But these are cells, so you have to go to another model and we use a mice model. This was done together with people in Porto. So they have a model which is a transgenic animal which expresses this neuropathic variant, the human one, right? And the animal, after two years and a half, has sim symptoms that are very similar to the ones that I, they have in human. So what we did is we put uh, the compound in their foot and then if we first analyze where in the blood of these mice, TTR was binding to the compound. And again, the same test. What you're seeing here is the amount of T4 bound in the blood of these animals after different, giving different doses of the compound, right? And you can see that clearly the amount of T4 bound to TTR decreases as you increase tolcapone. So you are binding to the site and you are displacing the hormone. And of course, what happens is that since you are binding here, you increase the stability of the protein in blood, the stability of these animals, which are a mimic of disease, and you revert the symptoms. Okay, so you can see how the stability of the protein in these conditions, when you take the maximal dose you can take from Parkinson, is around three times higher. Finally, we went to humans, so we selected two human candidates, healthy, and in this case, we're already working with the drug, with TASMA, right? And uh, they took it either in the dose, min in the minimal dose for Parkinson disease or in the maximal dose, there is this administration or this administration. And then we take the blood from these guys after <coughs> 48 hours and we analyze the stability of their protein put in and under uh, stabilizing conditions, right? And you can see how when the patient take, or the patient, the person take uh, the, the drug, 
rapidly, the stability increases a lot. When it takes the maximal dose, it absolutely protects the protein from aggregation in the human blood, okay? So this compound works. It's together with the bisoberone, it's already in phase clinical two, clinical trials. So far the data are very good. They have been working with C healthy individuals, 15 people that have the mutation but not the disease, and six patients that have already the, the below the disease for the B30M mutation. And what they saw in all the cases, protection of 100% of TTR at the lower doses, right? It's safe and uh, so far there is no side effect, okay? What is the nice thing here is the thing here. Tasma costs 1,000 euros per year. So the company, we don't have any rights on this compound now. The company has 100 times to negotiate, right? Even if it wants to win 10 times more, it will be 10, 10 times cheaper than the other drug, okay? What our lab is interested in is in this kind of diseases. Remember, there's a part of the TTR which is in the brain, okay? There is no treatment for disease, diseases, and they are very aggressive, okay? They cause uh, stroke and bleeding in the brain, they cause ataxia, they cause dementia, they cause blindness, okay? And tafamidis doesn't go into the, the brain, right? Talk upon it does. Right? So our <coughs> work is now working with this kind of variants. This variant is extremely aggressive and only aggregating the brain. Can you imagine why they only aggregate in the brain? Because you have making the same variant in the liver as well. And you don't have anything in the heart, you don't have anything in the nerves. They aggregate only in the brain because they are so unstable that the liver kills the protein before it goes out. So the machinery detects that the protein is misfolded and the protein is not secreted, right? In the brain, you have T4, you have tyroxine in the parenchyma, which is where it's made, okay? And T4 stabilizes this molecule, right? So it can be made, but it goes out to the, the brain blood, the protection is no longer there, you lose the, the tyroxine, it dissociates, and immediately it aggregates in the vessels, right? So these are very difficult mutants to work with, but we have demonstrated so far, we have six mutants for all of them, the, it binds. Look at the protection. The protection is not 100% in any case. We range between 60% with this mutant and 40% for the best mutants. But this is as much as T4 can protect, okay? So it's better than having T4 in the race. So if tolcapone arrives to the brain, very likely it's going to stop the aggregation. And we have the crystal structure for all these mutants and it docks in the same cavity. And this is not trivial because there are no crystal structure for these mutants. And the reason is because they are so aggregation prone that when you try to crystallize them, they aggregate amorphous. When you put the compound, you can solve the crystal structure, all right? So this is the first story I want to explain to you. I will just finish with the second story, which is related to that, and is this one. So remember that this mutation causes polyneuropathy. There was Portuguese family that has this mutation, but they were healthy. None in the family developed the disease. And what people did is they sequenced the other allele, and what happens is they have one mutation in one allele and another mutation in another allele. So two mutations. And this is what is called a trans suppressor. This tetramer is very stable. So since you are making the two subunits, the two monomers, you generate proteins that have on the average, the wall type of stability, okay? And this is trans suppressing any activity. These guys are absolutely normal. So it was thought that this will be an opportunity for gene therapy, and it works. If you get a mouse model, the same what we used before, and you express at the same time this with an adenovirus, adenovirus the mice doesn't express any of the phenotypes, okay? When we were working with Maria, we find by serendipity a mutation in residue 108, a mutation in a guy that didn't have the disease, right? If you look where it's located, it is located in the same cavity where tolcapone binds. We say perhaps this mutation will be a, no a novel transsuppressor because what we are doing is a mutation 
of alanine to valine, so you are putting one methylene group, right? You have four subunits, there are four methylene groups. So what we did together with David is we solved the structure and we saw that effectively the cavity gets filled, okay? We still saw that here you have some room for putting more things, right? So what we did is an artificial mutant designed in mutant in the lab in which we mutated alanine 108 into isolers, right? So now you have two more methylene groups, in total four more, and you can see that the cavity is filled, right? We solve the crystal structure and it fits. And then we analyze it where these mutants will be acting like possible transuperson or not, okay? Is it working? Okay. And these are the experiments, right? So this is the same experiment I showed you before. This is aggregation of the wild type, sorry, unfolding of the wild type. And this is the natural transuperson, the T119M, okay? The one that people in Portugal discovered before. This is the natural one we have discovered. You can see that it's much more stabilizing. This is the natural one we have designed it, right? So essentially, it protects against dissociation, right? This is a kinetics. You can see how it dissociates the wild type, how the Portuguese mutant dissociates slower, how the natural mutant we have discovered dissociates slower at too much level, how the redesigned protein doesn't uh, dissociate a lot at all. And this is under pressure. So this is the most stringent test you can do. So you put the protein there and you put high pressure. And this is perfect to dissociate the uh, structure. And you can see the dissociation of the wild type, how the natural mutant is strongly delayed, how the designing mutant doesn't dissociate even at this uh, pressure, which is extremely high, right? Higher stability should be related to lower irrigation propensity, right? And this is what happened. This is the aggregation of the wild type and the aggregation of our mutants. So essentially, these two mutants doesn't aggregate at all. So we have discovered and redesigned it, the most stable variant of TTR, which potentially can be used for gene therapy. And uh, we have some evidence for that, always in vitro. What we have done in this last experiment is you take our redesigned variant, you take the pathogenic protein, and what you do is you unfold them all, okay, into monomers. And then you mix together, and what you expect is that you have a combination of these. Some monomers will be, some tetramers will be essentially pathogenic, some of them will be made by the mutant, and you will have distribution among them. When you look at the resistance of this population, which mimics the population you will have if you use a transgene, in a front of the uh, pressure, you can see this is the unfolding or dissociation of the pathogenic variant. This is the overstabilized variant, and this is the mixture. So you can see that this dissociates much slower than the pathogenic variant, and in fact, this mixture is much more resistant than the wild type, right? So in principle, you can use the designed protein for uh, therapy. The last thing I want to show you, this is just a curiosity, but I wanted to show you. Uh, it was just uh, last October, I was invited to a meeting on healthy aging, right? And I said, okay, but what do you want me to be there on healthy aging? I'm not doing anything on aging. And before going there, I began to Google TTR and aging. And I get a surprise, and I want to give you with this a surprise, okay? What I found that there are special kinds of guys that are called super centenarians. Super centenarians are people that live longer than 110 years without no apparent disease, right? No dementia, no diabetes. They are very, well, they are less than 1% of the population, but they are more common in Italy for some reasons, okay? It turns out that these guys die essentially because they have a heart attack at one moment, okay? They die in the bed or they die while they're making some activity. And they die because with this long time, they accumulate a lot of amyloid in the heart, okay? And this is senile systemic amyloidosis. So this is the first cause of diet, according to the clinicians, for the supercentenarians, okay? So what people was proposing me in this conference is taking tocopone, taking talfamidis on a regular dosis to avoid to have TTR deposited in your heart, okay? I'm not going to do it, but this is another research 
possible research application, right? And in fact, if you Google it, you will see that it's people that is already buying Plasma to do that. That's all I want to explain you. Just let me show you the team, the TTR team, which is only a part of our group. These are the people in my group that worked in this project. Of course, David Reverte and Pablo did the structures, right? Adrian did the ITC. Nuria uh, led some biotech uh, project, and they are the guys that make the repurposing. Natalia in the scripts uh, is the only one that has this cardiac system, and Rosario has the mines. Okay? And thanks for your attention. Salva, thanks for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I found very interesting as well the fact that uh, Tolcapone, it was the, the primary use was Parkinson. So which is the main target for Parkinson? And could you see any link? No. <laughs> no, uh, the, the nice thing of Tolcapone is that, uh, in fact, I have to tell you that some has already licensed the, the compound, right? They have to get uh, good money. It's a coadjuvant. So it's a stupid molecule if you want to see. What it does is, I th I'm not an expert eh, in what it does, but if I go back, what it does essentially is that you administer these people uh, L-DOPA, right? And L-DOPA is degraded by uh, an enzyme. So the, well, the lifetime it has in the brain is limited. And this is a kind of, not an inhibitor, but a modulator of the activity of the enzyme that degrades L-DOPA. So the aim of this compound is just making uh, L-DOPA living longer in the brain, okay? So it's quite, I don't know, will not say innocuous because it's interactive with an enzyme, right? But it's not the primary target. What it does is extends the life of the compound that alleviates uh, Parkinson. The, oxi the elimination of L-DOPA, so it's like competing with one amino oxidase or those kind of things. But, but in this case, I'm not sure it is. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know which is going. I mean, the secondary effect. You know, the problem with this compound is that some people reported there was some hepatic damage. Okay, and this one of was one of the caveats. But uh, so far, the people that buy the brand didn't notice that. They are giving the lower doses, which is 200. But this is enough to to inhibit total degradation. It's very effective. The, I mean, it's, it's these are things that uh, happens from time to time in the lab. Okay. And if you can't stand on that, everything comes from a mistake. So we have the best compound because we make a mistake in, in the docking. So when you make the docking in principle, so once we have selected all the compounds, right, you make the docking, what you should do is you have two cavities. You should empty the two cavities. What we take is we crystal the crystal structure with the families to begin with, right? And then in principle, you should remove the two compounds, the two tafamidis and introduce the two ones, okay? The two normal ones and make the docking. At that time, we, don't know, we didn't know much about this negative cooperative effect, right? This is two years project, so we are just entering in TTR. And what we stupidly make is we only eliminate one of them. So we make the docking with a pre-docket tafamidis in the other side. And that's why Talcapone is very good, because it's good to adapt to a second side when you have the first side already full. And this is all the trick, that it was not made on intention. So all the trick of Tafamidis, and they are, I mean, the nice thing of this story is that since it comes, there are three papers that have tested uh, it, and it works better than Tafamidis, okay? Each one wants to demonstrate that it's on comp there are compounds that are better than Tocapone, but the thing is they are toxic, okay? So in vitro there are, I will not say a million, but there are thousands of compounds targeting TTR, but the problem is how good they are in, uh, in vivo, right? But they compare always now to families to Capone and their compounds, and repeatedly the compound is better. And the only thing is because it, it doesn't have this negative cooperativity. We made all this work, it's a lot of work, but all the problems with the revivo was this 56, 56 KD for the cardiac variant. They don't trust that we have no cooperativity at all because it's the first compound that doesn't have any cooperativity. And well, it was Adrian making all the experiments in one side, the other, the other, and the other, until we convinced the, I mean, nothing about the mice, nothing about the humans, everything was in the cooperativity of the system. Other questions? 
Okay, if this is not the case, let's thank Salvador again. It's Patricia Casino from the University of Valencia. She studied there and made her PhD there with Alberto Marina in the IBV from the Physic and uh, moved there with uh, Ramonica Halfandrak to the University of Valencia where she has started her group. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that it's a pleasure to be here in Barcelona. And I'm going to tell you what we do in the laboratory, trying to understand how two component systems, uh, signaling systems uh, work through uh, looking at their 3 3 structures and why we are working with these two component systems. Because the systems, they are the most abundant signaling systems in bacteria. They are also present in plants and fungi, but they are absent in mammals. So they are good targets for uh, the design of antimicrobials. And uh, these two component systems basically are formed by two proteins, one called the histidine kinase and the other the response regulator. And they work together very specifically with little crosstalk. Um, the majority of the uh, histidine kinases are membrane-brown uh, proteins that sense the signals outside of the uh, membrane, signal membrane, like phosphate supply, magnesium, redox states. Okay, sorry. And transduce the signal uh, to the cytoplasm. We are interact, interact with the response regulator, and this molecule then generally acts as a transcriptional factor, um, um, activating and repressing genes specifically to generate the final response. And these systems uh, work basically by three reactions. And uh, the arrival of an external signal to the sensor domain of the histidine kinase triggers the binding of an ATP molecule in the CA domain or catalytic ATP binding domain uh, that uh, phosphorylates the histidine in a dimerization domain called DHP in an autophosphorylation reaction. Then the phosphoryl group is transferred to the response regulator to the anaspartic residue conserved in this receiver <coughs> domain of the response regulator in a phosphotransfer reaction. And then uh, the response regulator triggers its response. And finally, the system is shut down by a dephosphorylation of the response regulator that is triggered by autohydrolysis by a water molecule or could be mediated by the histidine kinase that can act also as a phosphatase protein. So, um, many years ago, we solved the structure of a complex between a histidine kinase uh, with a response regulator. Here you see the histidine kinase, the dimer, because usually they, they work as dimers generally, and uh, bound to two molecules of the response regulator. Here you see the catalytic histidine in the DHP domain, this amelization domain helical, uh, that is pointing to the aspartic uh, catalytic residue present in the response regulator. And between them, there's a phosphate, the sulfate group. And uh, at that time, we um, uh, thought that, or we proposed that the reaction that was taking place in that complex was the dephosphorylation of the response regulator mediated by the phosphatase activity of the histidine kinase, something that we knew in vitro, biochemically in the laboratory, that was happening. But the most interesting thing is that the ADP, the nucleotide that binds in the catalytic domain, uh, was very close to the histidine, the catalytic histidine, within the same subunit. And um, what does this mean? It means that if you can model here a phosphate group in the ADP and then uh, use another rotamer of the histidine, this can very close, as if you could be seeing the autophosphorylation reaction also of the histidine kinase. But the interesting thing is that this was coming within the same subunit. And why is it interesting? Because um, at that time, um, it was very well known that histidine kinase could trans autophosphorylate, meaning that they are dimers. And because they are dimers, the ATB bound in the CA domain of one subunit would phosphorylate the histidine in the other subunit. And this was proved biochemically for two histidine kinases. So that's why it was already um, um, accepted in the field that all histidine kinases could trans autophosphorylate. But we proved uh, biochemically that that was not the case in our histidine kinase. The crystal structure gave us a clue and we proved biochemically that in our case, the histidine kinase was cis autophosphorylated. And uh, why is that? We then some histidine kinases cis or trans autophosphorylate. So at the time, we had the structure of the histidine kinase, HK53, that we were working with. 
and the NMR structure of the DHP domain of a histidine kinase that was proved biochemically, biochemically to trans autophosphorylate. And if we superpose this DHP domain that contains the catalytic histidine, and I show it separately for clarity, then you see that the alpha one that contains the catalytic histidine is occupying in space the same position in both histidine kinases. However, the connection between this alpha one and this alpha two, this alpha two that connects the CA domain, is different. Is here left-handed, while in this case is right-handed. And this difference in the connectivity, what it does is while this is uh, happening, the phosphorylation within the same subunit, this is happening from the other subunit in a trans way. So we realize that the connection between these helices, this area up here, was the cause of having a cis and trans autophosphorylation, but we have to prove that. So what we did, sorry. So what we did is we uh, interchange this area between these two proteins. So for HK53, we introduce this uh, apex uh, area of the DHP domain of MVZ here and in the way around for the other protein. And then we had these two chimeras and we tested the phosphorylation of them. So um, I'm not going here to explain you exactly uh, all this process, but I will tell you that it, it is a dimer. So the, the first thing we need to do is to differentiate phosphorylation of one subunit or the other. So we prepare heterodimers. But heterodimers with mutations that either could show us either trans autophosphorylation or cis autophosphorylation. And let me just um, look uh, here at the pattern of the histidine kinase. The HK53 shows this pattern, while emphasis chimera shows exactly the same pattern. Not trying to get into detail of the mutations, but this is telling us that this histidine kinase is phosphorylating in Cs as the same as the wild type protein. Just this exchange of this area has changed the directionality. In the same way, this chimera shows trans autophosphorylation in the same way as MVZ, just by changing this small area. So uh, the next question. Uh, was to try to understand or see that change structurally. So we saw the structure of this MVZ chimera, as you can see here, and um, we trapped the molecule here in a conformation that was asymmetric. You see here the DHP domain that you can also have in this orientation, and the D CA domains are differently oriented with respect to the DHP. So we caught the protein asymmetrically um, uh, bound to this AMPPMP. This is an ATP analog non hydrolyzable And this molecule was looking towards the histidine. We had trapped the protein in a conformation of cis autophosphorylation. And this was as asymmetric. At the time, we proved that this histidine kinase also cis autophosphorylate asymmetrically. So um, we then look at the DHP domain. And indeed, MVZ chimera was showing the same directionality as HK53. Yes, by changing this area up here, we could uh, make this difference. It was not any more uh, similar to MVZ, but to HK53. It was changing this small area again. Um, the good thing is that the same year we published this structure, it was published the structure of another histidine kinase, CPXA, that uh, trans autophosphorylated. And when we compare the structures, the first thing you see is that the CA domain that contains the AMPPMP is in the same orientation in both uh, histidine kinases. However, the connection of the helices is different. Again, this was telling us that we were right. That is the connection that was giving the or transdirectionality. But more than anything is that when, we su when you superpose the active site of both proteins, the residues that they are involved in the um, in the autophosphorylation of the reaction at exactly the same position, meaning that the autophosphorylation mechanism is independent of the cis or trans autophosphorylation. It doesn't matter that at the end of the uh, apex of the DHP, you have different connection between the helices. The mechanism is exactly the same. The residues that they contribute here to the catalysis, they are exactly the same position. So uh, this was telling us that this mechanism could be universal for histine kinases, independent of that difference. We also wanted to test, uh, because as I mentioned before, every histine kinase interacts with its correspondent uh, response regulator. So HKA53 interacts with R468 and MVC with OMPAR. So we tested the uh, 
phosphate transfer of these uh, proteins, of these chimeras, uh, to the, uh, these two response regulators. So the wild type of transfers and dephosphorylates, this protein was very well with its corresponding response regulator. However, it cannot phosphor transfer to OMPR. However, the MVZ chimera changes totally. So the exchange of that area was causing now a different specificity and recognition. In the same way for MVZ, when um, it can phosphor transfer uh, to R46A, but phosphor transfers better to its correspondent on par response regulator. However, the chimera changes totally too. So the area is important for the recognition of the response regulator. And what does it mean? It means that when we saw the structure of the complex, we had the area that docks the response regulator. And it turns out that it, it has a similar area than the area that we exchange in the EFX. So, Definitely, the response regulator needs to dock in that area, and so that area is important in the recognition. It's important in the recognition, so probably cis and trans at the phosphorylation, it is related with avoiding crosstalk between molecules. So uh, here, the variability that has the apex in size and sequence is necessary to avoid this crosstalk and how you go to cis or trans, how you connect differently left or right-handed. So the handedness of, connect, of the connection has to do with the sequence and the physical chemical features that this sequence is giving you for the connection. And so, although this area is conserved for the uh, autophosphorylation reaction, this area is variable in order to avoid crosstalk. So, um, in the laboratory, we also wanted to understand a little bit more uh, this, um, this directionality, trying to understand if we could, in our model uh, histidine kinase, we could change that by deleting uh, one residue at a time in this DHP domain. So we made deletional mutants uh, additive here at the end of the DHP with one deletion, two deletions, three or four deletions or in this connection of alpha-1 and alpha-2, of one, two or three residues. And then we checked by heterodimerization if we were having cis or trans autophosphorylation. And uh, what we observed is that when we start to delete uh, one uh, residue, we still have cis autophosphorylation. However, when we start to introduce three more, four residues here in the DHP, for deleted residues, then we turn to see trans autophosphorylation. In the case for the loop area, just by deleting one residue, two, three, we start to see this uh, change into trans autophosphorylation. And how this change in autophosphorylation uh, is related with the phosphor transfer of the protein. So, I, sorry. Sorry, I forgot to say here that we also did a mutation where we just proved definitely that what we were looking was trans autophosphorylation by making this mutant that just could uh, trans autophosphorylate. But how this um, trans autophosphorylation is doing with the recognition of the response regulator. So here is the interaction of the histidine kinase with the response regulator. You uh, lose the radial level band, as I mentioned before. You for transfer and dephosphorylate at the same time. But if you see this mutant, you for transfer quite well. Although in this one, you don't see almost for transfer. Yes, few for transfer, but you uh, dephosphorylate poorly. Okay, in this one, you also barely dephosphorylate. In this ones, you also can for transfer and dephosphorylate. Maybe similar than wild type. Here, sorry, I'm going to pass this. There was a problem with the slide. Okay, this was the the, um, the dephosphorylation reaction, but believe me, that is uh, a little bit lower than the wild type, but again, the mutant that I mentioned you, uh, it was uh, also a uh, dephosphorylated very low. So now we wanted also to know uh, how was the KD, uh, calculate the affinity between the histidine kinase and the response regulator, these deletional mutants of the histidine kinase with the response regulator. Uh, you see the uh, KD of the wild type with the response regulator uh, using this uh, bioleria interferometry bleed where we mobilize the response regulator and then we pass the histidine kinase to see the association and dissociation. So um, the KD for the binding of this complex is in the nanomolar range as we are increasing the deletions of one, two, or three residues, we see that it lowers the affinity. The, um, the, the, the introduction of four deletions 
uh, lowers even in the three orders of magnitude the KD, as you can see here. So again, it's explaining the poor for transfer and the poor deposporulation because the binding is quite low. But in these delisional mutants, of one, two, or three deletions at the loop area even uh, enhances the binding uh, with the response regulator. And because we do a structural biology, we want to know how these complex are between the histidine kinase and the response regulator, how these histidine kinases uh, also behave, how are these disease and trans in the connection. So we've done um, a lot of essays, we obtained several structures, uh, but um, it's difficult, the resolution is quite low, so I'm going just to show you one of the structures that we obtained. Um, so what we obtained is that we saw a tetramere in the active site, this is uh, the, the uh, delisional mutant with three residues at the loop area, the connection between alpha-1 and alpha-2. And what happens, this is alpha-1, and instead of turning to alpha-2, it stretches and then elongates, and alpha-2 is in this way, so now it, 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 instead of dimerizing, it tetradimerizes. Tetradimerized, okay. And instead of binding now um, two response regulators, it binds eight response regulators four in this area and other four in another area. Okay, I'll explain you a little bit more uh, the, the structure of this complex. So here you have the histidine kinase, as I mentioned, this is the alpha one, this is the catalytic histidine, and how the deletion here at the DHP connection has stretched this alpha two in such a way that now it can um, dimerize, well, tetramerize with the alpha one in this way and also in this way, making this tetramer. But this tetramer explains the trans autophosphorylation that we were observing in such a way that now see that the catalytic histidine in this subunit that is in dark blue in one subunit is close to the ATP in the other subunit that is in cyan. So now this explains us the trans autophosphorylation that we were observing. It was not in a dimer, but in a tetramer. See here, this was the dimer, how this alpha one turns into this alpha two. In this case, alpha one elongates this alpha two. Again, as you uh, can see here, again, this uh, catalytic histidine reaching for, from this alpha one is close here again to the nucleotide of the other subunit in a trans mode. So can this be happening also in the other uh, mutants? So, uh, oh, sorry, uh, first. <laughs> Just to say, the interaction uh, with the response regulator, as you can see here in the, in the wild type, is very similar. It's in the same position. So this has not changed. Although the resolution is quite low, it's 3.5 angstroms, and we still have to work a little bit farther in the refinement. Uh, still, you can see that interaction is going to be very similar. However, the interaction with the other response regulator is quite um, productive. Here you have the uh, catalytic aspartic acid. It's quite far away from the histidine, so that's why we say unproductive, probably because of the stretch. It has opened some areas in here that now uh, they are recognized maybe by the response regulator, and so it docks there, but in an unproductive way. So it can happen, uh, this structure of tetramere in the other delisional mutants. So if we see the gel filtration experiments with uh, one delisional mutant in the DHP or two stays as a dimer, however, when you introduce three deletions or four, you start to see uh, some change in the equilibrium towards the tetramer. And in the case of the one delisional mutant, you also uh, see tetramerization, and with two and three, you again see the tetramer. We also have crystals uh, for these um, mutants and also the structure, uh, and again, it's a tetramer. So this is telling us that the DHP uh, connection, this loop, is very important to maintain the stability of this structure. So uh, in the laboratory, we are not also interested in the histidine kinase and the, the complex between these two proteins, but also in the response regulator, how they phosphorylate, how when they are phosphorylated, they interact with the DNA. So uh, these are the structures uh, of response regulators that we, saw, we have solved in the laboratory. And phosphorylation, uh, we have um, been able to obtain it uh, in the presence of beryllium free fluoride that is uh, mimicked of the phosphoryl group. And uh, when we phosphorylate the response regulators, in some occasions they remain as tetramere, they dimerize in a specific way, or in a swap way, or even this is the full structure of our response regulator with the DNA binding domain, it dimerizes through another interface. So we are also interested in understanding how 
uh, the same phosphorylation how the same phosphorylation at the active site that makes all the catalytic residues look exactly different, this uh, uh, arrangement of the residues in the active site are exactly the same in all response regulators, how these can trigger different interfaces for oligomerization. And we are also uh, working hard on that. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this RCSD response regulator, that it's a response regulator that is very important in bacteria and interbacteria, that is involved in many processes in the uh, formation of biofilm, in cell division, is also in movement in the flagella production. And these response regulators resolve the structure, the full length with the DNA binding domain. It dimerizes in a way that there are three structures in the DVB at the moment that they dimerize in the same way. However, look at the disposition of the DVDs. They are in a different disposition, away and far away and with a high flexibility. However, in our case, these DVDs were interacting with the receiver domains and also the DVDs were interacting between them. Looking at the structure, we realized that um, the disposition of the, DSP, the, the DVDs, the DNA binding domains, were competent for binding to DNA because there's a structure uh, of NARL that it belongs to the same family uh, of the DVDs bound to DNA. So the superposition gave us a clue that probably we were looking the uh, structure of the response regulator competent to bind DNA. So to check that, what we did is we uh, uh, prepared some mutants of uh, this area, several areas, that were interacting with the DNA or that were interacting between the receiver domain, the domain that binds uh, the phosphorus group and with the DNA binding domain and check the uh, binding to this promoter region in the master uh, regulator, master operon for uh, flagella. And what we observe is that first, we uh, see binding when the protein is phosphorylated. This is telling us that again, we need phosphorylation to acquire these these uh, conformation, but also uh, mutations uh, here in the alpha line in the recognition helix of the DNA impairs the binding. Here the binding is a lower affinity. Here is this residue up here, the clashes, that is a little bit lower the affinity because we made with the concentration dependent. But here the interesting one is this residue up here that is here in this interface, alpha one, that it makes a hydrophobic pocket. When you change it to aspartic, you break that. Uh, hydrophobic pocket, you don't see binding, but when you change to a phenylalanine, then you increase this hydrophobic pocket, you see binding. And also mutations here in uh, the interface between the receiver domain and the DVD also is able to break uh, that uh, interaction. So this is telling us that we are looking at the conformation competent for binding to DNA. But uh, we also solve the structure of the response regulator in the absence of beryllium three fluoride. And what we obtained in the active site is that we saw um, three dimers that they were uh, placed in a such a way that it looked like a cylinder. I don't know if you look at here, this looked like a cylinder, where here the two bases are formed, if we rotate these, are formed by a trimer of the receiver domain, these receiver domain that are connected by the DBDs here in the center of the cylinder. And this is the structure of the uh, dimer, one dimer extracted. And you see here the helices that bind to DNA, the, the, uh, what was binding to DNA, the recognition helix, that they are exposed to the solvent. We'll see if it combines or not DNA in that way. But we see now the active site. And the active site, what happened is that in com when we compare it also with barium trichloride, first, it contains a sulfate ion, again, mimicking a phosphate. And also the residues that they are involved in maintaining uh, the phosphate uh, um, uh, bound in the active site were exactly the same as in the presence of barium trichloride. So we were looking into another conformation of this protein uh, active and phosphorylated. What does it mean? Because as you see here, this conformation is totally different. The receiver domain here is not interacting anymore. And now it's the DVD that is kind of swapped or cross, and now interacts um, the DVD from one molecule with the receiver domain of the other molecule. Well, so let me tell you that in this way, the alpha 9 could bind DNA. And could bind DNA, but uh, two double strands of DNA. 
And if we plot this in the examer, it could make even a like a helical, like a supercoiling or DNA looping that we still don't understand. And we made a mutant here in this alpha 10 that it contained a cysteine. This cysteine uh, can make a disulfide bond. But sometimes we have to add copper phenantroline to force a little bit more the activity of these cysteines to interact and form this, this disulfide bond. So when we have this uh, dimer attached in this conformation, we don't see binding to this promoter. So certainly to this promoter, this response regulator cannot bind but it could bind to another uh, DNA sequence. So now we have to understand this another phosphorylated structure of a response regulator to which DNA it binds and why it needs to bind this. We believe that it could be related with uh, DNA repression because this response regulator binds to many sequences of DNA or they work uh, as an enhancer trying to get closer to promoter regions of different, um, of different genes because uh, it's been that this response regulator can heterodomize with other uh, transcriptional factors. So uh, we still are trying to understand uh, these, uh, what is happening in here. So uh, finally, and just to summarize, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we are trying to understand how this system works, the histidine kinase, the response regulator, how they work together. And we have learned from this is that the autophosphorylation reaction in the histidine kinases is conserved despite these different handedness of cis and trans that they have, and this is related with avoiding crosstalk between the response regulators, and the response regulators, even though they, they uh, need to phosphorylate to activate and have a similar arrangement in the active site for that purpose, and that's why they have this conserved uh, residues for that, uh, they dimerize in different strategies in order to have different disposition of the DVDs uh, to interact with the DNA, showing again the plasticity of the response regulators. And let me just finish uh, thanking uh, the laboratory of Dr. Alberto Marina, where this work has been performed, and with the aid of Laura and Cristina. Uh, and that's it, and thanks to the funding, and thanks to all for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. Fantastic results. Questions? <laughs> I know it's a little bit different than from what you've heard, <laughs> and so it could be a little bit, uh, mm, but well. <laughs> Something about the, um, the last structure. I think that this is amazing, no? That we got this uh, DNA looping that we don't understand very well. We saw that uh, there's another structure of a transcriptional factor eukaryotic that also uh, binds these two parallel DNA, well, uh, DNA is anti-parallel, but these two double strands DNA, so we have to understand what it means, but there's, and that transcriptional factor is also related with activating different uh, uh, promoters, so maybe. Maybe you could make some experiments with extended DNA and see if it uh, is yeah, really. Yeah, we could do that, you could do that, yeah. Well, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, um, thanks the organization for inviting us to present our company, Transplant Biomedicals, as an example of, of entrepreneurship in science. Um, my name is Marcus Sachs. I'm business development manager in Transplant Biomedicals. Um, I have a BSc in biotechnology, as maybe some of you here in the, in the crowd. I did a master in, in business administration because one day I decided that maybe lab was not meant for me. Although I really love science and I wanted to still be engaged in science. So I moved off sector. I left the lab behind and I moved to the company sector. Then I met Ignacio Eros, which is the CEO and co-founder of Transform Biomedicals, and Dr. La Carmen Peralta, which is the inventor and co-founder and scientific director of the company. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll give you five insights of what is Transform Biomedicals, what are we doing in the company, and what are we trying to develop right now. And then I'll, I'll explain all the development process that went from the idea that was Transform one day to the company that has raised 4.5 million euros today. Uh, as first, I wanted to sh throw a question to, so to the people here. Um, do you imagine a sector that hasn't have any type of innovation in more than 60 years? Well, in transplant biomedicals, we actually know one of these sectors, and this sector is transplantation. 
the transplant that was performed over 60 years ago um, for the first time was preserved in a typical isothermal cooler box, a picnic box. Um, and today, the organs that are being transplanted are still being preserved and transported in the same picnic coolers. Um, 60 years ago, the donors were healthy and the organs were of good quality, but nowadays, um, due to the um, growing age of the donors, this quality of the organs has been decreasing and new strategies have to be developed in order to increase the quality of these organs for transplantation. Um, I'm sure because the presentation is in Catalan, I, I had prepared it in Catalan, but sorry if someone has any question in, in, in the uh, presentation, just ask. Um, nowadays, over two million people are expected that are waiting for an organ transplantation. Six people, uh, six percent of these people will only receive it, and one of every ten people will die in the process of waiting for one of these organs for transplantation, and they'll be waiting even months or even years. Also, to this um, problematic that there is a lack of organs in, in organ transplantation, um, the organ transplant process is also a process, a process that has a really low um, performance. Um, more or less over 60% of the organs that are donated um, are not an exit in the transplantation and only a 40% have an outcome of a successful transplantation. This is due to the quality of the organs that are being donated nowadays, also that the preservation strategies that are being used today are not efficient for this type of donors. And maybe because then when you implant the organ, you have um, an acute rejection from, from part of the patient. Um, nowadays, this uh, med need the market has is being covered by the picnic coolers, as I mentioned before. This technology, it's, it's a very simple um, technology. Uh, the basis of this technology is that you lower the metabolism tax rate of the cells to a 12%. You decrease the degradation of this organ during the ischemic perfusion time or the ischemic time that you are preserving and transporting this organ. But this has an added limitation that's that organs are preserved in a preservation media that has some drugs in it in order to enhance the preservation. But can only access and protect the organ in the outer case. But the interior of the organ um, acts as a um, barrier. It doesn't allow the permeabilization of the drugs inside the organ, and then the quality of the organs is lowered. This is when some our competitors, the perfume machines, appeared in the market. They appeared in order to overcome this problem, this problem that the organs act as a non-permeability uh, um, organ. Um, these devices have not demonstrated a real um, clinical efficacy up to date. And they use a really invasive technology because you have to get the organ, you perfusate the organ, you make the preservation media to circulate inside of the organ in order to preserve it, all of it. But this has some limitations because there needs to be a human manipulation of the organ, and this sometimes induces to error, and these organs are discarded and cannot be transplanted further. Furthermore, some of these machines can cost around 1,100 1, euros, which is a lot of money for some of the um, countries, like for example in Latin America, that are not willing to pay this kind of money for this, for this kind of technology. So what are we doing in Transplant Biomedicals? Transplant Biomedicals is a spin-off of the Babs Hospital Clinic of Barcelona. Um, we are developing a technology that's called hypothermic ultrasound preservation technology. This technology has its basis in the combination of cold, hypothermia, plus the ultrasounds. Where does this idea come from? Well, it's, um, it's quite straightforward. Um, as you might know, ultrasonic sonophoresis is being used nowadays in order to permeate the epidermis, or the barrier that goes to the brain. So the idea of our co-founder was, why won't we use this type of technology in order to enhance the permeability of the organ and the drugs inside the preservation media will access better the organ inside and will preserve the totality of the organ. So this is what we're doing right now in Transplant Biomedicals. We have this technology, we're trying to develop a device that's intended for the preservation and transportation um, of organs for transplantation. And right now, the, our value proposition is that we're going to 
increase the organ pool, the, um, the organ donor pool for transplantation. We're going to enhance the survival rates of organ transplant receptors, which is quite low nowadays. And furthermore, we're going to enhance the functionality of the organ at the first days of implantation, which is where most of the failure of the organ transplantation occurs. Our value proposition of our TB1 device is it will join the best things of the previous generations, right? We're going to have an efficiency, an efficacy that's at least as good as perfusion machines. We're going to have um, ease of use that can cope or compete with the picnic curers, as it's going to be a really intuitive technology, and as you can um, see, it's a non-invasive technology. And furthermore, it will have an, uh, a price that will compete with both of them and will be more proximate to the picnic coolers rather than the perfume machines that cost a lot of money. Well, now I'm going to explain you the whole process from um, how Transplant Biomedical went from an idea to actually building a company that has raised 4.5 million euros nowadays. And I want to say that um, this is just an example. Every company is different. Every development process should be different. But um, I think that some of the points are, are, are quite... Um, or can be transposed from one project to the other, and, and we'll discuss them right now. Well, after more than 20 years of hepatic um, transplantation investigation, our founder, um, Dr. La Carmen Peralta, senior investigator of EDVAPS, um, she had this idea that maybe sonophores, ultrasonic sonophoresis could be applied to organs in order to enhance the permeabilization of this and allow the drugs in the preservation media to enter it. When she had this idea, sorry. when she had this idea, she she had two roots, and I think this is the, the inflection point that, that allows me to be here um, in this amazing project. Um, she could take that typical way, which is develop this idea in the lab and publicate a paper, an article in a, in a renowned journal, and the story would end here. But she took the other route, which is to develop this technology, patent it in order to develop a spin-off that nowadays is called transplant biomedicals. I, I want to point one thing here that's really important. That's that when you um, publicate a journal, uh, an article in a journal, it goes to be part of the state of the art and you can no longer patent it and you lose the commercial bi bi viability of this project. But the other way around is not a problem. If you patent, patent something, then you can publicate it in a journal without, without any type of problem. Well, here is the, the first challenge no, that Dr. Carmen Peralta found. Um, and it's what I would advise you if you're in this process and you have an idea that you think that might, might have a commercial viability and can be built in a, in a project. Um, contact the, tech, ten, the technical office of your, of your, of your investigational group. Um, these people are the people that are prepared to tell you if this has a market need that can be covered if you can put, pretend this, um, this idea of someone else has, has done it before. The technology transfer offices are, are built to, to cope with this, with this responsibility, to take the ideas that search in, in investigation groups like yours that you're working right now and see if this has a commercial viability and help you in the process of building, of building this. Well, here in Catalonia, um, we have a, an entrepreneurial society that, that's quite well established. Um, our founder, Dr. Carmen Prata, she said, well, what do we need first in order to build a company? We need money. And she went to contact Casa Capital Risk. It's one of the venture capital here in Catalonia that have most of the experience building projects in science. And the first thing that they asked for her is, well, we really like your idea. We think that this could work, but where's your business plan? And her answer was, business what? She as a senior scientist, he's always been in science. He doesn't have the knowledge in business. And the next step was, well, we really like your idea. Why don't you go to the Bioemprenado Bintiu, which is a program that occurs here in Catalonia. It's, um, it's an accelerator of startups, or spin off rather in this case, that helps you build your idea and your first bi business plan. The business, sorry, the business plan is the next challenge that you will encounter. Um, this is the Bible of your company. This is the ABC of, of business and, and any startup that you want to start. This is where you're going to write down your, all of your ideas. And it's the first thing that um, investors are going to ask you, because they need to understand 
What is your idea? What are you doing? How are you going to do it, which is the most important thing? Who's leading this project? What are doing the competitors? What are you going to offer me in comparison to these competitors? Because if you have a therapy, a new therapy, for instance, and you can only offer me a 10% improvement in efficacy, but it's uh, RNA, the interference RNA, and it costs 10 times more than the generic that right now is in the market, it's going to be really difficult to build a project around this that has a commercial, a commercial value. Once Dr. Carm um, Carmen Peralta surpassed this, the, this phase, she had a business plan, she had what she thought that was the most important part to contact investors. She contacted them and the next thing that they said is, we like your idea. Now it's not only an idea, it's a project. We like your project, we like how your, your action plan that, and how you want to develop this technology. But um, you don't want to leave the science background. You still want to be a senior investigator in EDBAPS. Who's going to be the person leading the company? And here is where Carmen Peralta met Ignacio Eras, which is our CEO and co-founder of the company also. And they started this, this perfect tandem that I call, um, and the deal was, uh, I will take care of the science, you take care of the business. And from now on, it's, uh, it's um, a deal that's been working really good. I also want to point out that this is not all of the cases in entrepreneurship in science. Some investigator can also change his scientific background for a new, for a new business idea, do an MBA, and be the CEO of the company. This is not a, a limitation, okay? But I, I really like this idea of I take care of the business, I take, you take care of the science. Um, and one of the examples is, for instance, Genentech, which um, so here I'm not, they, they commercialized the, the cloning technique that you are using every day, maybe, in your in your daily basis, and they made this project be a commercializing success, and now they are one of the biggest biotechs in the industry. Well, after they met each other, they decided to found Transplant Biomedicals. This is maybe the, the most important part, because you have to found a company, you have to put in a name. In this case, it was called Transplant Biomedicals. And here we can find different challenges that I'm gonna enumerate right now. The first challenge is to close the tech transfer agreement with the tech with, um, transfer office. Um, this is something that might take a little while, because in our case, for instance, the UA was behind it, the SIG was behind it, Hospital Clinic was behind it, the BABS was behind it, and you have to agree with a lot of people how are you going to agree with this, this technology transfer agreement, right? Um, this technology transfer agreement, if, if you're not familiar with it, at the end is, I give you the patent of this technology, of this new breakthrough therapy. Um, you don't have to give me money right now, but when you start commercializing this product, I'm gonna get money in forms of royalties that can go, I don't know, to 2%, 3%, 10%. This is something that you are gonna agree with them. And the first thing that you need when you found a company and uh, a denominator that you're gonna see in the whole process is, I need more money. You will need more money every day. And here you're in a process that you have a business plan, you have two people that are going to lead the project, but you still don't have nothing. It's, it's basically an idea an idea that has still to be demonstrated, but you don't have the money to do it. Here, um, in our case, we raise the money with the three Fs. It, uh, the three Fs are family, friends, and fools. These are the typical way of getting money in this early stage. This is a uh, family that give you maybe one, 2,000 euros, 3,000 euros, and everything adds up. In, in the case of Transform Biomedicals here, we, we raise um, li really little money. It's 70,000 euros. Might seem a lot of money, but in order to develop a startup, it's really little money. Um, well, after, after this money was raised, you have to really know that this money has to be spent smartly, right? And a, st a startup is always um, a game of, as I mentioned, uh, to look for more, f for more money. So you have to spend this money in order to give the technology an added value that can increment the value of the company and that will attract interest of people that are willing to invest more than 50,000 euros and are willing to invest maybe a million euros. So in this, in this period, our efforts were focused on developing the technology. As I mentioned before, right now it only was an idea. We didn't have the knowledge internally of the ultrasounds, so we engaged with the um, um, University of Valencia, which are one of the biggest experts in Spain 
in, in ultrasound technology as we didn't have this know-how internally. We have the business part and the science part, but we were not having the, the engineering part. Here, it also started one of the, of the key points of Transform Biomedicals and I think every startup, which is the, the human capital. Here, you can see, oh, sorry. Here you can see part of the, of the founding members and uh, the staff that was from the beginning developing Transform Biomedicals. And this may be one of the most important parts. Bear in mind that here at the beginning, you cannot pay people um, what they would be earning in other companies, maybe. So you have to find people that are really engaged with your project, really believe in this, and that are willing to take some risks in, in this new adventure. Also, I want to point out that, um, as I mentioned, friend, family, and fools are one of the biggest parts to, to bring money into the company at this stage, but also public funding is, is a must. Um, normally public funding, um, they don't ask you for, for an aval of your property, so you can, um, you, you can raise money um, that won't delude you as an investor, i.e. as a founder, and will help you develop your, your company and your technology to a further, to a further stage. So here Transform Biomedicals had the two people that had to lead the project. We were already building a, a team. We had done a proof of concept in the laboratory. We built a, what we call the Frankenstein at that stage, which wasn't really looking as, as good looking as the device that you saw earlier. And we did a proof of concept that we did a study of those response with the ultrasounds and checked which was the intensity and the frequency that gave us the, the maximum results in order to, to see um, higher efficacy in these organs that we were preservating. So then, uh, the next stage was to raise more money again. Um, here we're not talking about the little amount of money that we were mentioning before. Here we were looking for 1.5 million euros, which is already a big amount of money. But here we're, I think we were more prepared. We had a technology that had been validated in, in um, not a proclinical model, but in an ex vivo model, which would be, for instance, for, for a drug, would be an in vitro assay. And we had all the tools that are necessary to uh, co cut the attention of, of investors that are willing to put more money into the company. Here, um, we started this process of the seed round more or less at the beginning of 2015, and this is possibly the most important part um, and the most vital part of our company. We started at the beginning of 2015, and we didn't close the deal until the end of 2015. This was a really rough year. This is maybe the most rough year that, that we had in Transplant, but it's also more, um, the most grateful experience that we also had in Transplant. Um, during this process, you will suffer a really exigent due diligence. Here in, in Catalonia, um, companies are not raising this amount of money on a daily basis. So the due diligence that you're suffering, they will look at everything. They will look, what is your technology um, giving as a result? Um, are these results correct? In which in vitro model have you demonstrated this? Is this the model that's more approximate to the clinical needs and the clinical outcomes that you are trying to, to demonstrate furthermore. And also, I won't enter into detail this, at this, but um, it's also a really um, financial examination. Um, well, it's, it's a rough process. That's, that's more or less the conclusion of all this process. Um, when we get this money, 1.5 million, we started the, the preclinical development of, of our technology, of our device. Um, this is a point that Everyone that's willing to, to start an entrepreneurial project should take into consideration and think about it properly. And, and I'll explain you why. Here is where the party starts. Um, you're going to start with a preclinical development that has to be aligned with the clinical development and the market need that you're willing to demonstrate further. I, I'll give you an example. I know, I know a company, it's not from Spain. They did all the preclinical development. They got 1.5 million, similar to us. They invested all this money, and when they went to the end of it, they realized that the molecule that they were using, it was a, home, a human molecule, and that once they would, should commercialize this product, they would use it in a cloning technique in a bacteria. So they had to repeat all the preclinical process, and they had lost 1.5 million. So this is something that 
you have to take into consideration this development has to be well studied. You don't want to waste money from investors that are giving you this money and are taking the technological and financial risk um, from your startup, okay? Uh, as I mentioned to you right now, um, we use this money in order to develop the preclinical essays of our, of our study. We used the rat model. We did it in liver and kidney, which are the two transplant organs that are most transplanted in nowadays. We have a, an ambitious pipeline that we will develop further more. We will develop the, our device also for heart tissue and cells, but this will come, will come, will come next. Um, I call this phase, I, I'm sorry because um, you cannot really see it, but I call this phase the Dead Valley phase, and it's, it's a phase that's really known in the startup industry because normally startups don't go further than this step, and I'll explain you why. There are two main reasons. The first main reason is that they didn't get the money, they didn't find the financiation of someone that was believing in their project and believing in their technology, and the second point is that the technology failed at some point. You sometimes have a technology or a drug that you can demonstrate the efficacy in an in vitro model, it works fine, but when you tr go into an in vivo model, it fails, and more or less, I don't know if you know the numbers, but this is, is common knowledge that more or less 90% of the startups fail, and this is where the majority of them fail. When we finished the preclinical development, we were going to a clinical phase, we are right now in this phase. We closed the 2.5 million Series A at the beginning of 2016-17, and right now we're developing this device. We are trying to understand better the mechanism of action, because this is something that when you go and commercialize a product, the doctors are gonna ask you, this works, okay, it has a safety profile maybe, but how does exactly it work? And this is something we're working on it right now. We're also developing the clinical prototype, we expect to get the same mark for commercialization of our product at the beginning of next year. And we're already preparing, like I mentioned before, a Series A, a Series B can take up to one year of negotiations with venture capital. So right now we're already starting to, sorry, to negotiate a Series B uh, that will be maybe up to 15 million euros. This is something really big here in, in Catalonia. And it will allow us to further go and expand our clinical trials. Um, the first clinical trial that we will do at the end of this year will be done here in Barcelona, in Hospital Clinical Barcelona and Bayern. And then our ambition goes further. We want to do a multicentric clinical trial in Europe and the USA. Oops. Well, and I, I don't know. Um, I don't want to miss the point that this is um, a company. Uh, history, but we don't have to miss the point that we're developing something that has to be transported to the patients and then it has to help enhance the quality of life of patients. So this is why in Transplant Biomedicals we're going to start these clinical trials that I mentioned before in Hospital Clinic de Barcelona and by the run, which will be a first-in-class therapy for organ transplantation, and we hope it's, it's, a, it's a success. And we're developing this technology in order that people like Sarah Cox, which is the, the girl in the images, she, when she was born, they said that their heart, her heart wasn't working. They, have, they gave her two days of, of life and she received a call that they found a heart for her. And this is the message that we repeat every day in transplant that we're working because more people like Sarah Cox have a second chance every day. And now it's my, my, last, um, my last message. Um, I think that the people like me in the past, I'm a biotechnologist in the past, I, I changed career, but I think that the people like you that are working every day in science and are at the peak of the innovation, maybe have the biggest responsibility, right, that this innovation gets transported to the market and that has a, both a social and a financial um, value back to the, the society. And thanks for, for listening to this speech and thank you very much. Any questions? Hello. I have some curiosity regarding the regulatory of this device. Yeah. Given the, the, that the standard of care is a Coleman fridge, mm -hmm. 
does it make it easier or more difficult to prove that your device is not harmful and, and, and is positive for the organs? Mm, normally, the regulatory pathway in, in medical devices, which is our technology, um, works in this way. If you have a predicate in the market that's using a technology similar to yours, it's easier to get a commercial, um, a commercial approval. In our case, this is not the case. Although we're using hypothermia, we combine it with ultrasounds, and this has never been proved in organ transplantation in order to enhance the clinical outcomes of transplantation. So in our case, it's, it's not this way. But if you have something that's really similar in the market, of course, the regulatory approval, it's, it's much, much easier. You don't need clinical data. In our case, we need clinical data in order to get to the commercial phase. Any other question? Sorry. Uh. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, just you have said in your talk that you make the clinical trials here in Valdebron and you will make it in the United States and other hospitals in Europe. Th that's why you, you want to have the FDA approved. You have to make clinical trials there in the United States. Yeah, exactly. For, for the FDA approval, they, they like to have clinical data in the U.S. Um, normally, with clinical data from Europe, it's not, it's not sufficient. It might be, but this is a study that's been made case by case. Also, I, I would like to mention, in our case, we're doing the monocentric clinical trial here in Barcelona, and the first approach is normally you only check for safety. Our technology is not harmful, and it's at least as good as the picnic coolers. Um, the multicentric clinical trials in the rest of Europe and the multicentric clinical trials in the U.S., it's an efficacy study in which we're going to check that it's not only safety, but it's better than what's currently on the market. And another question about public funding. You say at the end you, someone may need some kind of public funding, mm -hmm. but I couldn't uh, understand um, what's like the consequences. Like you need to, to ha they have share like the state uh, in your project or something? Um, normally venture capital investors, friends, family and fools and business angels, they take equity of your company. This means that they take a percentage of the company. I give you 10,000 euros, you give me 1% of the company. But for public funding, it doesn't work this way. You have two types of, of, of funding from public, um, from public entities. One is a loan, a typical loan with a 3%, 4%, 5% interest rate. And the other is like um, um, subvention. Sorry, I, I don't know how to say this word in English. A grant, yes, uh, thanks. Um, uh, the typical grant, you don't have to give the money back, it's only money that goes to, to R&D. This is something that in Spain, you don't have many public funding in, uh, as, as a grant, but, but there's some, there's some. It's really competitive, but there's some, and you can access it. Question? I don't know exactly how it works, but... Um the benefits of this uh, spin-off never goes back to the university or... or yeah, yeah, of course. Um, when you uh, make a tech transfer uh, agreement with, with one of these um, investigators, um, you normally give them royalties. So they give you the patent, they give you the technology, you have the exploitation rights to commercialize this technology, but you have to give them something in return. So mm -hmm. when you get money, when you commercialize this product, you give them some percentage of your benefits back to the organization. Oh, okay. So this is also a really good way that they can fund themselves retroactively. No? As more projects go out to the market, more money they will get and the least money they will need from the public and national uh, programs. Yeah. More questions? I have also a question. So sometimes these companies, these spin-offs, even when the technology is good, where they go, uh, when they are going through the dead valley, the money is running out and they need to find an investor to put the money they need for the next step. So I, I want to, to ask you if you can explain a bit which was your experience, because apparently you, you went successfully through this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true that in, in this phase, um, you don't expect that the negotiation takes a year. So you have money 
for mid-year and you start getting to those dates and you see that you don't have more money, you don't know how to pay the people that are working for you and this is something really stressful. Um, but there's ways of getting money. As I mentioned, you, you can ask for public funding, but also if you never build a startup, don't worry on taking loans. In, in, this, in the case of Transplant, we took microcredits from loans. There's also the possibility of going through crowdfunding, which is a quick way of getting money. Although in my personal opinion, I don't recommend it, at least in our sector, because people don't have the, the knowledge in order to know that these um, companies have a really, really high technological risk and a really, really high financial risk, so they don't really know where they're putting their money. And I, I don't really like crowdfunding for, for health startups, but it works and, and you can use it as long as, as you are really clear with the people that are giving you this money. So in Transform Biomedicals, the thing was um, build as much, much evidence for the venture capital that was asking for this information. So venture capitals, they normally will ask you, uh, what's your commercial plan? What's your clinical plan? And it, most of the time it's something that you don't have. Um, and of course you don't tell them that. You'll tell them, okay, I'll have it for the end of the week. You have to work um, <laughs> 20 hours a day, uh, sleep very little, but this, pay, this pays back. No? And then Transform Biomedicals is an example of this the hard work um, really pays back. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Oh, short question. So from the day that the scientists decided to make the first step to create their company until the day that the, we mentioned sees the light and goes to be commercial. In your case, how, how, many, how many years this could take? It's more, is this the average or? It's more or less, in our case, it's five years, but this is a, a record time. The standard is six and a half years in health. For a drug, for a medical device, there's no, that's not a really big difference. It's six years, six and a half years. Um, it's a long time, it, it's, as I mentioned, hard work, but it, it pays off. So, there are no more questions? Thanks a lot. I, I would like to say one last thing. If anyone here is thinking that their PhD can develop into a drug that has a potential, they want to be an entrepreneur, don't hesitate in content, contacting us. We'll sign an NDA, don't worry, we don't want to steal your, your, your idea. But it's true that here, um, it's a more, small sector, we have to help each other, and in Transplant we'll help you whatever questions or anything you need. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>